Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I think you probably all, most of you know that I'm the recruitment manager for DisplayLink. This is my second time at DisplayLink, actually. I joined back in 2007 as employee number 36. And I had a little gap in the middle, but I rejoined uh, 2016 when we had got to 150 and I've now helped the company grow to over 300. And uh, as Louise said, I concentrate on hard to fill niche positions rather than volume recruitment. So this is my take on recruitment and you know what I've done uh, in all the companies I worked with, but mainly at DisplayLink on, uh, how to, to grow the company and um, doing what is good enough. So I chose the title, uh, what is good enough, because it really sums up the challenge of doing enough due diligence uh, while also being fast enough um, so you don't lose the candidates by being too slow. It's always a compromise. In addition, you have to <coughs> look at the cost of man hours when you're, um, which, you know, tied, which will be tied up in interviewing. Um, I think it was mentioned in the, uh, the email out that there is a, st a statistic somewhere, and I read anyway, that it's 10 times more expensive to mishire than not hire at all. And I, and I think it's probably true enough. So, you know, how do you achieve this compromise? Now, I think I've discovered over the years, uh, probably more years I want to admit to, it's over 20, um, you have to go back to basics. So it really is, you know, understanding the role. You know, I was taught when I went into recruitment all those years ago to never ever work a position that you don't fully understand. You, you know, if you've got a good enough understanding of the position, then, you know, you should know the style of candidate uh, and what they usually like and how they tick. And, you know, this will allow you when you interact with them to buy enough time uh, by attracting them better, they will wait for you because they're interested. Because you know what buttons to press. So, you know, for example, our agile team, when they're looking at scrum masters, uh, th they will actually bring them in for coffee uh, as the first touch. So this is not telephone interview, this, you know, there's no such thing as an informal interview, but they will bring them in for um, a coffee and for a chat. Now, Clearly, that's not impossible at the moment um, physically, but you know we can do something on a, on a group video call, and um, it's not as good, but it still works. Now, this might sound a bit odd and time-wasting way of recruiting, but it really isn't. Um, having a team chat with that candidate allows a very solid and quick understanding of this person will fit into the team. Now, this is an absolute essential um, for all roles, but for uh, a scrum master or a product owner, an agile team, it is very much about the character. So, you know, understanding the role, um, you know, understand essentials and desirables. So I'm going to pause there because uh, I think you know, there might be some questions on that. Silence. No, we haven't had any questions <laughs> thus far, Lewis. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. I think... Um, yeah, don't be shy. We have had some questions um, that we were sent over beforehand um, that I think we'll kind of run through at the end. But okay. yeah, feel free to. I'll carry on then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll into. I'll into. Oh, hold on. Uh, no, nope. okie doke. Um, we don't have a Q and A box, unfortunately, on this right. particular. Uh -huh. We do have a question. How do you tell if they're not on the best behaviour? Um, so we will come on to. Um, I'm pretty sure I'll come on to teaching your interviewers uh yes of course they're going to be on best behavior but putting them into a relaxed environment you will see more of the person and they they will let their guard down a bit um but it really is about training your interviewers to um help the candidate relax lower the guard uh, i suppose and uh, we don't mean that in an evil way you really want to know the right person but by asking the right questions, then you, um, which I will talk about probably later, um, you, you will get the truth. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a risk, but um, you know, they, they compensate for that. They, they factor that in. So in addition, um, you know, 
the candidate, if they are the right style of person, will become very keen on this position, the team and uh, the company. Now this does, actually, we've just answered this, this does assume that your team are well-trained and they've got to be excellent ambassadors of your company. So, you know, if they're not, then you really haven't covered the basics. So I said, go back to basics. You know, you have got to get that right before you start recruiting. There's no point recruiting, no point having your interviewers talking to candidates if they don't love your company, don't love what they do, they're not ambassadors um, of your company because you're just going to put people off, you know. So you, before you even start recruiting, fix that bit. And the candidate will be willing to wait longer now because they know that this is what well, they think, this is the job they want. And, you know, don't be fooled into thinking you don't have competition, um, especially currently, um, candidates and companies think there's nobody hiring. It's not true. A lot of us are hiring just as hard as normal. I've got, uh, well, Display Link's got something like 17 vacancies I'm trying to fill at the moment. Um, you know, we're hiring people. Um, I've hired three in the last four weeks. Um, so some of us are hiring uh, as normal or even harder. So, you know, this is a race. Um, now, other candidates may wish to just dive right in and, you know, some just like seeing tools and toys. And this is all about you understanding what's important to them. Um, you know, you know what's important to you, but you need to understand what's important to them. So when we do a, a telephone interview or initial interview, it's key that we understand all their motivations. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, you know, why are they looking? What are they looking for? What's most important to them? Understand them like an assassin understands their mark. Now, I really can't stress this enough. If you learn all this and you know how to ask these questions, and so I've had lots of practice, God knows how many thousand people I've interviewed now. If you know this information, you can play it back to them during the interviews, and that keeps them interested. When you come to offer, you can go through each and every single point of the things that are of importance to them and show them uh, that you are offering everything they have asked for, or if not, then you need to address that and say, well, we, you know, you're gonna get this, but you're not gonna get that. You've gotta be honest, um, you know, is this close enough for them? Uh, probably a good time to pause again. Yes, um, hi Lewis, yeah, there was another one um, as well from Barbara. So what happens to if someone seems to be a good fit at first, but the team dynamics change, uh, you can't necessarily do it for the long term? Uh, yep, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, life is not perfect and that can happen and this does happen. And, you know, team dynamics change, people move teams, um, <clears throat> people change and, you know, they can have personal problems and so on. Um, yeah, you, you have to handle it as you would a normal uh, HR issue. You might need to move people. You might need to um, give people coaching, mentoring. So we have a very, very capable HR team and we have a software practice manager. Most of the companies software, actually. Software practice managers who uh, give training and mentoring and coaching. We have a very capable head of agile and agile team. It's all about supporting these people, and you know, if if you can move people around to suit, it's better to fix the original problem, though, and you know, give them the assistance they need, the coaching or mentoring, very different things, to solve whatever the problem is. And you do that. Um, yeah, things change. You just have to. Well, actually, I'll go back to the beginning. People have got to be ambassadors of your company and enjoy working with your company. If you don't fix those fundamentals, if you don't actually have everything into place that makes people want to work at uh, your company and stay there, th then you know these things will, uh, will go wrong. So um, this is very much an HR question and yeah, you have to have the framework to help there. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Lewis. There's a few more come through. Um, good discussion points here as well. So on balance, what is the prime motivator for candidates to want to join a company from an employer employee standpoint? Okay, so I'm talking from purely a display link experience point of view of what I hear time and time and time again. Uh, it's going to be um, excellent team that will i can get on with and support me and help me grow uh 
technical challenge. I want to feel that I'm actually contributing and making a difference. Um, so it's culture and and technical challenge stroke on making a difference. They're the top two, I would say. And then the third one varies so much because it really depends on their circumstances. It's rarely money. It's sometimes location because they need to come to Cambridge. Um, it, it really varies, but those are the top two in my experience. Great, perfect. And one from Catherine. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> nice to have you here. Um, how do you know when you ask your candidate what is important um, that they aren't saying what, sorry, how do you know when you ask them what is important that they aren't saying what you think you, you want to hear? So basically, yeah, are they, are they kind of answering the questions as um, in what they think you want to hear rather than what they actually think? How so, do you know how do you uh, so I, ask multiple questions at different times that are very closely related to, to each other. So for instance, why are you looking? What are you looking for? What you're not getting where you are at the moment? What's the most important thing that you're going to think about when getting a job? I'm looking for consistency. And if they're not consistent, then I, you know, I, I've got alarm bells ringing and I know I need to ask more questions. Um, by asking multiple, multiple um, related questions, which, when your spider sense says, eh, I'm not getting the truth here, um, then you, you will, with experience and practice, you, you will find out what actually the, the real, uh, real answers are. It takes practice, like everything, you've just got to keep trying. But you know, right now, I have a, a crib list of loads of questions. I don't ask them all, but um, the, they will all help me get that truth in the end. Have I answered that okay? Yep, yep, Catherine's nodding, so <laughs> <laughs> perfect, okay. Um, and another question that, which is interesting, and I think this must, this will probably vary um, to sector to sector, but um, this, this um, question is, I tend to have a reverse way of ensuring the company is right for me by making my website with blogs and social media public. Do you look through these? Uh, I personally don't. Uh, I know some companies do. And uh, it's partly because I have got time. Um, you know, the, I, I am the, the recruitment team for Cambridge. There is an HR team, uh, but I am the only recruiter in, in, for displaying in Cambridge. And you know, I uh, I just don't have time to do a lot of that research. I also not too comfortable about it. Um, I, I think it's crossing the line a little bit. I don't tend to stalk on Facebook and things like this. I would much rather uh, do a proper interview over the phone and uh, meeting and so on. So no, I don't. I personally don't use it, but I know, and, and do that. I know some people do though. Mm, I think it, sometimes it's industry specific, um, you know, depending on the type of role. Yeah, I think so. If, if it was, um, you know, an artistic role, you know, you'd have a portfolio and this would be absolutely crucial. Um, so I think it, again, is, is what's fit for purpose. Uh, the bulk of the, the positions that I hire for are, um, you know, firmware engineers and things like that. And they tend not to have this type of thing might be different with the agile scrum master you know you'd look at what conferences they've gone to what 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 uh, they, you know if they've spoken to anybody uh, spoken at any conferences what books they read um so i might look at their linkedin profile there's some good hints on there so right. actually in retrospect yeah i might do if it's a scrum master or product owner and look at their linkedin maybe okay so probably depending on the role in the industry i, I think but oh absolutely yeah. yeah okay um and another interesting um someone looking for some advice on a on a case study actually so um victoria they're recruiting um recruiting a team leader the current team is managed by uh, victoria and her husband we're get, getting some kickback from the team not wanting this new person yet to be recruited running the team any advice oh let me think on that one um So, so the, uh, what I think you're saying there is that the, the team is pushing back because they don't want a new person managing them and you haven't got them on board. Mm. And yeah, so yeah, it's a tricky one to ask. How can I answer this? So it really depends on the structure of your company and how large it is and so on. Uh, again, I'm going to be talking from a display link point of view. Uh, so we 
have, we're fairly flat. Um, we're very agile, so we have agile teams. Uh, we are um, very keen that new positions are talked through with the teams before we actually go to market. We always try and hire internally first as well. And uh, so we'll advertise internally before we go to market. So that those teams uh, are already on, both, on board before we recruit. Uh, so again, it's going back to the basics. So those employees need to understand why there needs to be a team leader. Uh, you know, what is the purpose of the role? What are you trying to achieve? Why are you doing that? Is there nobody internally already that can step up to it? So it's really, it's communication, it's talking, talking through. Now, again, it's gonna be a compromise because you will get some, some people that don't like change you know, and they don't want a new person in and they're, they're you know, what, why are they pushing back? Are they fearful that you're gonna put someone in that they dislike? And you have to counter all those feelings and, and you know, um, you know, get them to be part of the, the process so they're comfortable with it. So it really is just going back to basics again, I'm afraid, but there's, there's never a perfect solution, um, but communication, communication, communication before you go to market, rather than saying, here's, here's somebody who's gonna manage you now out of the blue. And some companies do that, and then they wonder why people leave. Yeah, definitely. I'd agree with the, getting the team buy-in um, initially, so explaining it. Um, and the reasons for the hire. Yeah, it's the um, reasoning behind it. And, you know, they might have other ideas that you hadn't thought about. Think, Actually, that works. Mm, definitely. Thank you, Joe. So there's one more. Um, are the battery of psychometric, psychometric tests any value? So this is something that I have looked at many a time and is something we don't use, uh, but other companies do and value very highly. I think, again, it depends on the type of company you are and the type of roles uh, that you have and volume. Because we are not doing volume and we have been interviewing for the same style of candidates probably since I joined, first time in 2007, we have never felt the need for psychometrics. Um, but I know other companies really value them. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I don't have any personal feelings one way or the other. I don't think they really would add value to display link because if it's not broken, don't fix it. Mm. Okay, perfect. So um, do you successfully interview and then hire managers that only broadly have the required technical experience and skills of the team they'll be managing? Yes, we have. Um, that's a nice one, I'm going to answer that easily. Um, so we have uh, software practice managers uh, that look after really, really skilled C++ development engineers, uh, both um, embedded and uh, application level. And I think at least two of the three that we hired recently came from different industries where they were not C++ experts, but they really understood good general software practice and agile and so on. In fact, um, Advert, we're hiring another one now. So if anybody's a good software practice manager, uh, we're hiring, look, it's on the website. And it, it's more about the transferable skills. It's all about uh, their ability to um, teach, mentor, um, assist uh, these line reports. They're not there to teach them how to write C++. That we have a C++ community of practice. There are tech leads who are fantastic C++ people. That's their job. Um, the line management is much more about the pastoral. It's about you know, helping them with test-driven development, all this sort of thing. So yeah, absolutely. So we do value them from different areas. Good. Um, and we've got um, a really good question here from a candidate point of view. Um, so it's good to have a mix of both candidates and employers on mm. today. So do you value candidates differently based on what channels they apply through? For example, referrals versus applications to the website? Um, value, I think, is the wrong word. Um, so you know, the blunt answer is no. However, if they were a referral, then um, I would feel, uh, I do feel the need to uh, at least chat to them and help them because, you know, I would be helping, you know, they, even if they're not right for display link, 
they're, they're obviously important to a colleague and I, I would then chat to them and try and assist them in even if they're not for display and get a role elsewhere um, you so it's not value you would definitely get more attention if you're a referral than if you came through LinkedIn or an agency or just emailed in absolutely you get a referrals always always get more attention doesn't mean you're a better candidate or not um, so you would still go through exactly the same interview process but you are because you're a referral you know you, you, you're going to um, do the right thing for, for your colleague by paying attention does that answer your question Sounds good to me. Um, I'll just see if anything comes back, but yes, thank you. So perfect. Thanks, Lewis. Um, okay, so how do you manage when the ideal candidate just isn't out there on the market? Do you wait or compromise your hiring? Okay, so I can answer that one very clearly again. Um, so we, uh, I think I've already mentioned, we hire former engineers and our, our ideal firmware engineer is something that's called a pre-silicon software engineer who's a firmware engineer that writes in C++. Um, I think they are unicorns with hen's teeth. So we're, do, we, you know, we're not finding them. I think they all work at DisplayLink. So we, we, and we need lots of them. I think I've got another five vacancies on those. So what do we do? Um, you, you can't just keep waiting. So you can grow your own by hiring lots of graduates and in fact we will be doing that uh, but that takes time um, so what do you do in the shorter term you do have to compromise now it's it's not straightforward because what we're looking for now actually are good C++ software engineers who have a little bit of embedded that are happy not happy are keen to become pre-silicon firmware engineers and that means actually that we have broadened it a lot, but we are going to have to teach and mentor these new employees on how to write firmware, um, which is actually a lot easier than teaching them how to write C++ if they're only C programmers. Now, there is an impact on that. Yes, it fixes the problem for Lewis hiring for display links. I can now hire people and we are successfully doing so. But what you're now doing is introducing uh, additional load to uh, the uh, the teams because they're going to have a longer period of bringing these people up to speed they're going to need longer mentoring and coaching but they will be brilliant people so yes we do um, but it's at cost and you have to do it with your eyes wide open it needs to be thought through and discussed and agreed before you change that spec but there comes a point where you have to and you uh, one of my main jobs as the recruitment manager is to feedback to the hiring managers and the team saying we're not getting anywhere guys i'm doing my best we're not getting anywhere you have to change the spec but i know this is the impact of doing so so it really is on the onus uh, the onus sorry it really is on the recruiter to be honest back it up with figures i give them stats i show them all the number how many cvs i'm getting how many i've interviewed how many have rejected and and you know we're not getting anywhere so you can't you can't use opinions you have to use data Excellent. sorry long answer but i hope it was a, a good one no very good thanks lewis um okay i think we're done with questions on that, that subject now i think we'll yep. probably move on to interviews yeah so yep. um so face-to-face -face interviews uh although they're virtual at the moment but it doesn't matter um it should be designed for each role do not this is in my opinion and display links experience do not try one size fits all in my experience that will just will not work um now again currently we're talking about virtual face-to-face -face, which means actually even more preparation and your testing of your facilities such as virtual whiteboards um and uh you know sometimes you actually need to um practice with the candidate so i had a senior hire recently where uh the the, the candidate had to do a 20-minute presentation to the exec team um and because he'd or he or she would really want to get that right so you know I, I said practice on me and we got it all working and he did need some fixing uh, and then you no know, he's now joined us so you know preparation 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 um 
so you know you need to allow the candidates to test their systems if you're going to be doing into uh, video conferencing interview styles which we're all doing at the moment so examples our software test interviews are very carefully crafted so we actually understand the way the candidates thinks and how they approach testing um, they've crafted this over a number of years uh, our software engineering interviews are really designed to show how candidates solve problems so our software engineers are engineers rather than software programmers they program yes uh, but they're, they're actually engineers who program um, our scrum masters interviews as i mentioned are quite different they're designed to show how a candidate interacts how they communicate how they experiment how they understand different team members and, and the features so these are all very very different style uh, interviews carefully crafted and you know, this makes them you know the interviews much more efficient it makes them reliable and you need to be able to have the same interview for the for those roles for those candidates so you've got a benchmark consistency it also makes more sense to the candidate you know they totally get why we're doing the interview in this way rather than a long line of colleagues asking similar questions one after the other uh, you know they should enjoy the interview and they usually do the other thing you need to do is retrospectives you know so what worked what did not work in the interview and you know if you're doing a uh, I and mean, this is even more important if you're doing a virtual face-to-face -face. you know you need to fine-tune your interviews uh, as sort of general advice is you know try and get your interviews on one day um, however people have lives uh, they don't like taking up holiday um, you know if a candidate is local again we're talking about when you can come into the office um, you know you can ask them do they want to come in piecemeal you know they can come in early they come in lunch they can late come in late you can fit them in in bits and they don't lose holiday that way they'll love you for it um, you know they think you're a lovely accommodating employer um, that bodes well for the future for them but it also allows you to stop the process if they bomb and you know that saves everybody's time so I have cancelled future bits of interviews and in fact I have um, stopped an interview when it's been in the office and it's clear that you know th there's no point wasting their time other interviews time um, after the first meeting it it's you have to be brave and I think in my life I've only had two candidates cry when I've done this but you know I have stopped an interview because it's just not going anywhere um, obviously easier if it's split up now you can't do this very often but you can and it's well worth it um, at the moment being being virtual uh, of course candidates are a lot more available but it's still good practice I think crucially don't let untrained interviewers interview alone train them train interviewers and have them shadow until they can fly solo and it doesn't matter how senior they are so this again requires a lot of confidence in you if you're an internal recruitment person um, stopping a senior member of staff from recruiting uh, a, a solo that they've never interviewed before doesn't mean they're any good at it um, they can do so much damage um, but you know you you need to train them and then they can benchmark the candidate and need to interview properly and again being ambassador they've got to sell to the candidate in an honest natural way um, I'm always very keen that our my colleagues are honest about displaying what they like what they don't like um, I'm a terrible actor people know whether I like displaying I love working displaying or not I, I'm not very good at pretending I, I just tell a story really I see questions come in, so probably a good yep. time to pause. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, we had some questions beforehand and we've left those until the end, um, just in case they got covered here. And this was one of them, actually. So um, great to have it through. So it was, um, do you consider the age of the candidate? Do you ask for the information in the application form? Uh, absolutely not. Um, it's irrelevant. And uh, it, it's not so much about age. It's more about where you are, where you are in your career or going back to what I was talking about earlier, what is it that you want to do? So people, this is generality, um, people tend to want different things, different stages of their life. So I am no longer interested in being, um, you know, a VP recruitment for a big corporate. I'm not interested in that. Um, you know, I'm probably at the tail end of my career and that's absolutely fine. I just want to do what I do better all the time. That's all I'm interested in. 
and I'll be honest with a, a company about that. Um, it's more about understanding what it is you want to do and now and in a, in you know years time or two three years time, because if we can't offer you that progression we need to be honest with you and there are some roles that we have that will not offer progression and we might be the wrong choice for you uh it might be that you know you, you you don't want to progress and that's absolutely fine again if that's what the role is um but there are some roles where we want the person to progress so it's not about the age it's a and it's not um and you can have different stages of progression um irrelevant of age you know some people just don't want to progress um so no um age to be honest i never look at the age um i i i learn from the interviews what it is that they want where what their desires are and i'm just very honest about it so i think it's more about your energy level more about your aspirations uh not about age does does that help mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> Sounds great. Thanks, Lewis. Um, okay, yep, yeah, we've got a few more here. So, um, how comfortable are technical line managers on testing and questioning for soft skills? Uh, so, we, this is why I talked about um, carefully designing interviews. So, tech leads will be doing tech interviews. They will not be doing that part of the interview. Uh, so if we take, let's say, one of our software development roles, there will be a purely technical, well, I say purely technical, um, the, the focus is on technical uh, interview for about an hour and a half, and they'll be doing, you know, a technical problem on the virtual whiteboard. And through that interaction, they'll know whether they can communicate with this candidate and whether they'd get on with this candidate and so on. But <clears throat> they really are focusing on the technical aspects and uh, communication, is this someone I could work with? Do they listen uh, and do they share their thought processes and so on? So they, they are doing a team fit um, by the process of the interview, but then they have another interview, uh, ideally on the same day, as I say, with someone who is um, very much trained in this area. So typically, if it's a software engineer, it would be one of the software practice managers. And this is, this is what they live and breathe. And, you know, they will be focusing on, can we manage you? Can you manage other, other people? Uh, you know, I, I view, is this the content of the job, what you want to do? So they will be looking very much at the soft skills, the managerial, I don't like the word managerial. Um, I haven't thought of a better word for it, but, you know, that side of it. So it's fit for purpose interviews. Each interviewer should know what they're interviewing for. And, you know, this is, again, planning the interview. So choose the interview that's actually qualified to do that. I think that's answered that one. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Um, to do a candidate side um, question um, as well. Does it look bad when you ask to rearrange an interview to a different day or time? Does it affect your chances of being offered the, offered the job as shows you aren't flexible? <laughs> <laughs> um, so all I can say is be honest. No, um, it shouldn't do, but it can be a pain. Um, if you keep doing it, then yeah, how interested are you? Know, it, it depends on the reason. If you just fancied a different company, then yeah, I'm not going to be too keen on you, but it is case by case and depends what it is. You know, you, one of the things, again, this varies from company to company. You know, we understand that you have a you probably got a day job. You may not, but um, you bigger your life as well. And things come out the blue. Um, it's just be honest and you know, people have very good reasons why they have to move things and um yeah don't under, underestimate how much work it can be to rearrange and interview somebody so you know think it through first and if you really can't make that day then yeah just be honest uh, so generally no um but that might vary from recruit recruitment manager or recruiter to recruiter to be honest yeah. but for me no as long, as long as they're honest and they've got a good reason you know it's just an irritation but hey it's life yeah absolutely thank you Dave. Perfect. We, want, we want you to succeed don't forget most recruitment people want you to succeed yeah true okay so um moving on i think shall we move on to being the employer of choice Lewis? yes so we've touched on this before but um you know everybody everybody in your company is the is an ambassador ambassador um so you know to succeed in how you have really really got to make your company honestly the employer of choice and you know the, the candidate 
we'll know if the interviewers are happy or not. You know, she, uh, so, as I said, most people are rubbish actors. Um, if you ever see me be a, a pirate in an Amdram, you'll know that. Um, I personally cannot recruit for a company I don't love working for. I just can't do it. Um, you know, if people are keen, they will delay other companies in the recruitment process as they want to join you. So, you know, it's so, so key that people are actually happy and you really are the employer of choice. Uh, now, we always do what we call um, a wash up, which is where we discuss the candidates after the interview. You want to do this as soon as possible. Same day if you can, uh, um, next day you know, at latest. We forget, so do it soon enough um, because you will you will forget, and you know you really got to write things down. And you know if you have multiple interviews in the day, you will I guarantee you will confuse the candidates. And let's say you had four, you you will blur them. Um, so it's really key that you document, you write it down, and you have that wash up that conversation about the candidate as soon as you possibly can. Now. I'm an advocate of um, a guy called Joel on software. He he he, um, he wrote how to the Gorilla's Guide to Interviewing. If you've never seen it, look it up. It's brilliant. Um, he pushes for a hire or no hire, not a maybe. Now, if you if any of your interviewers are sort of meh, not sure, that means you don't have all the information or a full understanding same thing really isn't it it went wrong um because you've not successfully interviewed never ignore a no uh, because you know one says no and the other say yes never ignore that no you know if you do then why did you bother asking that colleague to interview how would you feel if you ignored you know it's no for a reason now you need to understand that reason but never ever ignore it and you know and the, once it's discussed, it, that no might become a yes, but only because they gain more information, not because you've turned them around and say, oh, no, he's fine, don't, you know, or she's fine. You know, they need to understand what it is, the, the missing piece of the puzzle. But, you know, you ignore that no at your peril. And, you know, I've had it a couple of times, not a display link, but I've had it a couple of times in the past where I was overridden because uh, one person said no. And then we exited those candidates. So, you know, you will pay for it. Um, so it really is, you know, are they good enough match on all aspects? And again, it's, you know, good enough. You will, it's, well, I don't think I've ever seen the perfect candidate. You know, are they good enough? Pause there, I think. Great. Um, no, it's great. I think we're all up to date in terms of uh, questions, questions, actually, which is really good. Um, yeah, we're working Move through. Move on then. Yeah. Good. So the next bit is offering. Um, now, don't forget that us wanting you as a candidate is only half of it so um, again from display link point of view we never point a gun at your head saying accept or we pull the offer on friday now to me that's a bully tactic it's so not our culture you know if you did that to me i'd run away instantly um you know i would not want to work for you um so this next idea is what we do it might sound counterproductive uh, speeding up the process but bear with me um we always offer candidates the option of um, coming back, spending more time with the team, learning more and make an educated decision on whether to join us or not. Now, again, currently that's not possible, but we can do it on a group video chat if, if needed. Now, I, I will have a call with the, the candidate and you know that allows me to go through some, what in my view is the boring stuff about benefits, but um, you know, if they want, they can talk to the team. Um, they'll be happy that they're joining those people. If you, for whatever reason, have an absolute personality clash, it's never happened, thank God, because it would be a, a real issue. You want to employ somebody and then there's this great big clash with somebody in the team, but you want to avoid these problems. It's not happened yet, but, but it also reinforces the importance um, to us of a candidate looking inside this building and knowing what they'll be joining and being keener to be part of this. It pushes, it pushes them away way better now than after they join. So 
it might sound like a delaying tactic, but it's not actually. It, it allows candidates to have all the facts to make an educated decision because this is so important to them. If we get it wrong, it's an irritation. If they get it wrong, that's their career, that's their life, that's their livelihood. Um, you know, we have very, very, very low attrition because the people that join us have had the opportunity of really understanding us before they make that that commitment. Now, so some people take up this option um, enough do to make it worthwhile, um, but um, you know, do think about that. It's it's a different way of offering and um, getting people to accept, but it, it works for us. I think that's that's probably the end. So it's now questions. Okay, perfect. So um, yeah, just could you repeat, um, Lewis, the name of the author you mentioned? Uh, oh, I can't pronounce it. It's Joel uh, Plansky, I think it is. Um, it's called The Gorilla's Guide to Interviewing. Um, and it was written a long time ago. I mean, probably 1998 or 2000 or something like okay. that. He's on version three now. He's actually one of the guys behind Stack Overflow. Oh, okay. Well, we can dig that out. We can have a look yeah. and send the link out. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so candidate question. Um, would you recommend making informal visits before applying? Obviously, you can't do it at the moment. If so, what sort of questions would you ask? Uh, so, in informal visits to the, the office? Yeah, I yeah. believe so. Um, so, it, we do. Um, so, yeah. it really depends on the, on the candidate, um, especially if I'm headhunting. Um, I will always say to a candidate, Come and have coffee with somebody in the team. You know, have a snout around, have a have, have a look around. You know, um, see if it's something you want to get involved in. And of course, again, it's never an inf truly informal because you're going to learn something about them in that uh, he or she in that process. Um, so you know, but if, if we're trying to attract people, we we will offer that informal uh, visit to tempt them into applying. Obviously, at some point, it then becomes formal, and, they, and then they are, you know, being interviewed formally. Um, it, it depends on the role. As I say, with the Agile, we, we do invite people in for initial coffee. It is an interview, mm -hmm. um, but it's a very relaxed interview. Um, so, if you if you have the capacity you uh, and there's the right sort of role then why not let them have a look but you've got to they've got to be interesting to you to for you to invest the time in those candidates or potential candidates of course okay great so again case by case uh, on candidate yeah. and company and role Okay, and I think that's answered, um, Bella, I think that's answered your question as well. Um, another one here, this is interesting. Um, how do you do this, Lewis? Um, I know there are probably lots of ways you can go, go, go around it, but on um, if someone's CV application, so someone's um, mentions their previous salary, um, how do you as a recruiter evaluate the difference? Say, for example, someone says they were previously on 35,000, now expects 42. How do you have that conversation? Um, so I would want to understand the package as a whole. And again, it's all about communication and being honest. So if I'm doing this phone interview with them, then, you know, I would exp I'd possibly explain to them what our package is and actually get them to, you know, to have a proper think about what, you know, what their package is worth. Because uh, companies are very different and, you know, the also they might be underpaid you know it, it really depends um again it's case by case um it's really about each side understanding their situation in this case it's financial situation so so one so one of the things um it's probably worth mentioning when we offer a candidate we in the paperwork that goes out we never mention a company bonus because um like most companies the end of year bonus is discretionary now, the word discretionary means you may or may not get it. Um, they, everybody has since 2013. That's when we've been profitable ever since. But I would not want someone to make a decision on join display link based on us promising, I don't know, a 10% bonus that doesn't happen. Um, but other companies do push that really hard, even though it may not happen. So it's all about being honest. So I want to know, I would like to know their full package so i can if we go to offer and then i can make sure that we're offering them something's fair so i think one of the um 
not misunderstanding, so probably something that's not appreciated. Um, at this, again, this is display link. We, when we offer a candidate, we try our best to offer them what they're worth uh, to us. And you know, this is why you need to get your interviews really fine-tuned because we have to benchmark. We're, we're doing our best to benchmark. We usually get it wrong, not always, but usually we get, sorry, get it right, not wrong. Um, and offer them a fair salary uh, for their grade, if you like, um, that's what we call it. If we do get it wrong and we've undervalued, then we will make an out of sync um, change to that. Now, so it doesn't really matter in some ways what money you're on because we're going to offer you this anyway. <laughs> um, but the reason I need to understand it is that you know, if we're clearly not going to be able to offer you enough, um, then you need to know early on in the process. So I've kind of sort of talked around it a bit. I don't know <laughs> if that helped. Yeah, and, and it leads on quite nicely, actually, we knew just talking about bonus schemes. Um, so for as a small business, Victoria has um, the experience of commercial staff and offering bonus schemes. But where do you start with engineers? Um, so engineers, it will be part of the, the discretionary end of year bonus because they're not commercial. Uh, so they don't have a sales bonus and so on. It may be different if, uh, you know, I, I'm going to make this up. Um, so if, you know, if they're a, a VP or a director of some sort of role, then there'll be a performance bonus for that, you know, management bonus, um, possibly. Um, and, but but it's, you know, you, you've got to be able to evaluate their performance to be able to pay them that and so on. Um, it's typically more in your product marketing, your, your sales, you know, commercial roles, uh, pure engineering. Um, then the bonuses would be to, more to do with uh, patents. Uh, we do have a patent bonus um, or the general end of year um, company performance and individual performance bonus, which as I say, discretionary. So um, that's how we, we handle it at DisplayLink, I think. Okay, and leading on from that, so if someone is, um, sorry, actually going back to the question on salary and someone um, asking for a salary level, if the candidate's dropping in salary, how do you approach that? Uh, so again, it's understanding why, you know, and if they're, let's say they're, they're really, you know, they're, they're in London on a, on a London salary and they're, they're Cambridge, um, it's not going to match. So that's, you know, that's realistic. Um, it, it's understanding the reasoning behind it and just, again, being honest on both sides. And, you know, I've taken pay drops in the past um, because I wanted the job um, and I wasn't working in London. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's understanding the reasonings and, you know, being being honest with people and then you know some people do want to take a step back um and that's absolutely fine if that if the new job that they're taking at less salary is right for them and you know this they honestly are going to do it and want to do it and it is less money less responsibility absolutely you know i've had quite a number of people like that because it's right for them now but it's understanding that candidate understanding this situation really so again, it's just back to communication and being honest. Okay, Louise has popped yeah. up. I think she's yeah, asking she my gauge. <laughs> so, um, I was just going to say, you've got, we're down to the last kind of 10 minutes or so. I mean, I know we've gone through a lot. We're still getting some questions in. Are you happy to, to carry on for a little bit? Uh, I am, yeah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Now, this is an interesting one and a bit of a... Um, have you got your crystal ball, I think, Lewis? So how do you think the candidate market will change from pre-COVID days when it was a candidate's market? Right. So uh, I will state that this is a personal opinion and not a display link opinion. This is a personal opinion. So I could be totally 100% wrong. However, I think that there will be a lot of candidates on the market who um have been terribly disappointed with how their employer has behaved um but they're not going to do anything about it now because you know they might be furloughed or they you know they you know whatever reason um they've not been treated as well and they will remember this and there are companies and i'm lucky i'm in one of them that you know we're i, I don't take it for granted i think we are very privileged working at display link but very lucky situation but we are being treated incredibly well. 
and I, I think candidates will get their own back. Uh, I think employees will, there'll be a lot of candidates moving once they feel safe to move. They won't move now because you know, they, they don't want to risk um, you know, losing their long notice periods and their health care and all this sort of thing. There, there will be, a, I think there'll be a sudden surge of candidates on the market. Some they just wanted to move anyway and some who are deeply disappointed at how they're being treated uh, currently. So I think, it, I think it will be a very, very interesting time and I will be watching it with um, great interest. I do, however, think it's going to be gradual uh, because of the, I think quite rightly, the way, again, personal opinion, uh, the way the government is handling things uh, is going to be a very gradual thing. So I don't think there's going to be a sudden switch to, um, you know, a click, we're all back to normal. That's not going to happen. But I think over time, uh, the market will settle down. But there is going to be a lot of, um, I don't like you anymore and I'm moving. Mm. Yeah. And then companies will recruit, you know, um, th those that aren't recruiting will will um, start recruiting again. Okay. But it will, be, it will be gradual. Okay, great. And there's um, two here that are kind of along the same lines on negotiation. Um, any tips for negotiating salary besides re researching around the salary from similar, similar roles elsewhere? How would you sell yourself for a higher salary than the company is offering? Uh, I do have another presentation on this. I'm just actually trying to remember it. Um, I think really you, well, you need to explain what you're on at the moment and why. And you say you could well be underpaid. And uh, it, 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 again, depends where you are, what the company is, the type of company. Uh, and, and so on. there's a lot of factors that affect, um, you know, your, your salary. Uh, and you need to explain that. Um, you also could talk about, you know, the the interest you're getting from other companies and the type of salaries that they're offering you. Um, those are the sort of the, the main ones, I'd say. Um, as I say, it really, again, this is display link centric. Um, it may be different for other companies. I will, for display link, have uh, a limit of how much I can offer you. And I will, I promise you I will do my very best to get you the most I can because uh, I want you to like me but I also want you to join um, but I am limited by the salaries that your colleagues of the same level are on in the building so we never ever deliberate, deliberately underpay so it's kind of sort of a moot point for display link because we'll give you the best salary we can anyway uh, regardless how good you are negotiating <laughs> um but generally it's you know just be honest be honest be honest mm -hmm. and tying in um to that question another one how um in your experience how often do people come backwards and forwards negotiating salaries for display link lewis or do they um, snap that off <laughs> not very little yeah very very little um if if money's the your prime motivator you're not a display link person um the so I asked the question, what is the top three things that are important to you when considering um, an offer or a job in a new company? Um, I, I very, very, very rarely get money as one of those three. It's about the opportunity. It's about the culture. Um, and the third one is usually um, learning location or something like that. It's hardly ever the money. People just want to be paid fair. If it's just money, you're not a display link to person. Okay. I think we've um, covered off most of the questions, actually. We did have a few beforehand, and one in particular was about um, top tips for online interviews. Um, and I know that you know Catherine Vid, um, who's <laughs> at the moment. Um, and uh, we did run a Cambridge Network um, webinar with Catherine on um, interview tips. So we can, we can certainly share that. Um, those slides but what's in terms of your opinion Lewis have you got any top tips around online interviews um, I think it's practice first um, you know make sure everything's working make sure you've got everything to hand um, I mean I've got what three screens up um, so go by displaying docking station um, and, and it really is practice 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 because uh, you don't want to be in an interview then have to run away or try and get your kit to work and so on. Just, you know, practice on a friend. I don't know, but um, 
or, or even on the recruiter if if they're willing to do that because um, then you know all your equipment's working you know think how, how would you behave in a face-to-face -face interview you know what would i need in that and um, it's preparation really um, i think my top tip generally and it's always worked for me is be yourself and be honest you'll never get caught out if you're honest but you know be honest and be prepared but also watch um, Catherine's video on virtual interview <laughs> yes very good <laughs> we'll send that out again okay we're coming up for our last four minutes and um, so if anyone's got any other questions please pop them in the chat box um, I think there was one other um, do you have an international recruitment checklist for international hires and that was one of our pre so what do you actually mean by that question? I know, it was one of our free ones. Hold on, let me go and have a look, see if I can uh, decipher. Bear with. Uh, yeah, I can't tell. Yeah, just do you have an international right? recruitment checklist? Um, it's for hiring internationally? Or? Yeah, I don't, I don't sure if I really understand the question. Um, okay. So fine. I, I'll answer in different ways possibly um so you one of the things i have to learn over the years is different cultures and how different people communicate from different cultures um you know I, we have a polish office so i had to learn very quickly um to to understand the difference between a, a polish candidate and an english candidate or eu candidate oh no polish are you um you know there, there are different cultures and you and you know there was a standing joke and apologies any americans out there um, if i've got american cv i divide by two and if i got a polish cv i times by two um you know so uh you you um you have to learn those different cultures so that you know how to ask ask, ask questions differently and how to read cvs differently uh, there's a hideous thing called a Europass CV. I despise them with a vengeance, um, but you know you have to. You know, that's what they've got, so you, you have to make um, conversations for that. So um, I, I think it's again prepare, learn, um, make uh, main changes for that. Um, obviously, you know if you're talking about visas and work permits, then you know it's roll by roll. Okay. And we've got one more. Um, do you um, what do you do with speculative applications? Um, so I will always respond to them, and um, you know if they if they are potentially somebody that we could hire in the future, I will ask the permission to hold on to them, uh, and usually connect to them in LinkedIn. I, I will again always be honest. If it's something that we'll never hire, then I'll be honest about that as well. So we absolutely we do. Um, I would actively recommend doing that to companies. Wade through the A to Z on Cambridge network uh, of companies, uh, and just because companies are not advertising a job doesn't mean they haven't got one. Um, there are numerous occasions for numerous reasons why we may have a vacancy that we do not advertise and we would love your CV so send them in with a nice covering letter <laughs> what harm are you going to do exactly <laughs> give it a whirl <laughs> especially yeah. at the moment so well, fantastic thank you so much that's yeah, really really you. helpful Lewis lots of great thank tips um, we've had a, um, if we've missed any questions by all means get into the my all means get in touch and we'll um, I'm sure Lewis don't, won't mind if we approach him with those uh, so absolutely coming through so um, yes, which is fantastic. excellent Thumbs yeah, up from thank, you. thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm just reading the one about the silly portals uh, that's why yeah. I don't use silly portals I despise them with a vengeance <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, that one. Perfect. Was the um, software guy you were talking about, Joel Spolsky? Was that the yep. guy? Yeah. Yep. Joel Spolsky, everybody. Oh, I, was, I was close, wasn't I? <laughs> you were very close. It's when you said that, I thought, ah, I know that name. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you for answering, uh, asking the questions and for Lewis for your time for answering all of the questions. Fantastic for getting through so much um, in such a short time, actually. Yeah, that just one minute session. over. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot. So that's it. Thank you, everybody, for turning up and, and uh, participating. It's been a great discussion. Um, and we'll have it out on YouTube soon, as they say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody, Thank for you. listening. Thank Thanks you. Thanks all. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>